So, um, what's it like to wake up from an attempted suicide? Um, well, it wasn't my first, but it was certainly my best effort. Um, what I had done to um, die, something that I'd planned over months, and, um, and the way I had planned it was that I was going to succeed. And obviously, I didn't succeed because I'm here today, but I'm here to share with you my story. Um, obviously, and I recognize and realize now that we all have our own a lot of times on this earth and we have our missions that we really need to complete. And if it's not our time, you're not going to go. It's just the way it is. And um, I remember waking up in that I see you. And I was a bit dazed. I remember being in a lot of pain. I was, I was being woken by the needles being jabbed in my groin area. They'd just given me dialysis and I had a breathing tube down my throat and tubes and needles hanging out of everywhere. And I just, it took a few moments to register where I was in the, in the ICU. And I realized, oh, I'm still here. But um, in my mind, it wasn't yet over. In my mind, I was still going to make it through and I was going to succeed with my plan. Well, and I, and I, you know, I remained in the ICU for a while. And then when I was well enough to go into that ward, um, I was about three days in ICU. And when I went into the ward, they were um, digging into my bones and my wrists for my current levels, I uh, don't know if I'm saying correctly, um, to check about how the kidneys were functioning. And obviously they were not functioning. They were not working. And it was not looking good. And I was in absolute sheer agony. Absolute. And I was dying for some <laughs> dying, some pain relief. Well, obviously I destroyed my kidneys. And there was no way they were going to give me any pain relief. And if they were, it was going to be Panadol. And it was going to be over a lot of time. So it was like, no overdosing happening anytime soon. <laughs> and so um, that was really, really difficult. I was in sheer agony. Um, yeah, it was awful, absolutely awful. But I was determined to see it through because I was still in that state of mind that I'm not going to stay in this earth any longer. I'm finished. My work is done. I can't do this anymore. I just want to end the pain. It's not about dying. I just want to, I just want to not exist. And that's the way it was for me for a very long time, is that I just didn't want to exist. And um, so, and I said, I asked them, so what's going to happen? My kidneys have failed and they're not showing any improvement. So what's going to happen? What are you going to, what, what happens now? And they said, you will have to have dialysis or you'll have to have a kidney transplant. And I said, can I refuse? And they said, you can. And so I was like, yep, I'm going to refuse. No matter how bad I felt, I was going to refuse. But um, it was a really tough time. And uh, I hadn't revealed to the doctors and nurses what I'd actually done. Although they clicked anyway, they picked it up. They knew. Um, I, will, I just had a story. And my story was I was out mowing the lawns and I went to scull some water because I was really thirsty, which I was mowing the lawns, drunk and skunk because the coolant that I had drunk was had an effect like alcohol. So I was like just, you know, trying to mow these lawns in circles. <laughs> and, um, and, and my story was that I drank a bottle of what I thought was water, but it turned out to be not water. And um, I guess, it, and so um, as, as they were asking me questions, because before I, when I went to the Tokoroa Hospital um, and my breathing was was increasing, um, I actually held, I actually drank it like hours earlier and I waited so that it could absorb into my system and um, so that it could have full effect. And if I, I mean, if I had drunk it and then I go straight to the hospital, they can pump my stomach and they can do all this and I'll be fine. I wanted the full effect. So I made sure I waited until I could barely breathe. And that's when I told my husband, look, take me to the hospital. 
I can't breathe. My breathing is getting bad. And going into the hospital, the, the, the doctors were saying, come on, slow down, calm down. And he thought I was overreacting. But he thought, oh, we'll do some tests to see what, what's actually causing this. I hadn't revealed what I'd done, but I just told him that, you know, um, taking something, but I didn't know what it was. And then I and then I did it, I, I eventually say, oh, it was coolant. <laughs> so then they realised what they needed to, to do was actually give me alcohol to, it was like a reverse effect of some sort. So I knew that because I'd studied it. So, um, um, and uh, like I just remember getting rushed into the ambulance because he, the, 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 the results came back and they realised this was serious. Um, I remember I, when I, as soon as I got into the ambulance, I was just out, no memory from there, and it was like, um, I think it was two days later that I actually woke up, and um, uh, yeah, so they had given me alcohol to to balance it out. So waking up, waking up was um, sheer agony, and um, all I wanted to do was pull this, this tube out of my mouth. It was horrible, and I was begging, please let me get this out, get me get this out. Oh, I need to go to the toilet. No, what, what? And they said, just just go. With, you know, they just had a big pan there, and, and I'm like, um, no, I think I'll wait. <laughs> but I couldn't go anyway. Anyway, so yeah, it was um, yeah, it was pretty horrible. And I felt sorry for the nurses in it. And I said, oh my gosh, they work so hard. Look what they're doing. They're fighting so hard. They're working so hard to save me. You know, they have so much gratitude for what they did. So yeah, in my mind, you know, I was so sick. Um, I wanted to die for a very long time, and what well, was it? On and off, on and off. And um, I was determined I wasn't going to see 2012. And I guess well, it was like three days later, and there was no improvement. And I was just praying and crying out, and nobody could do anything because I couldn't have any pain relief. And uh. Yeah, I remember um, I, they had they'd have a nurse with me like 24 hours, constantly watching. Um, I said, "You don't need to be here," but no, they're good company. And um, turns out that she was from my church, yeah. so we had some conversations. But I had a, um, a spiritual encounter, and um, it was like a it was like a stern, authoritative man, like as spoke to me, and he said that. Um, you need to get better. You must heal. You 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 need to get better. You know, and so I realised, oh my gosh, I have to get better. And so I guess something. It's almost like I got touched with something where I went from I'm determined to to see this through, to 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 die. To suddenly, oh, I've got to live, and and it's almost like I had this renewed life come into me, and so. So all of a sudden I became, I've got to live, I've got to get better. And I started to will myself the toxins to go out of my body. like Because I, I had um, one of those things with, uh, what they call it, <laughs> where they, you get your urine into a bag. And um, <laughs> and so they were, looking, they were looking at it to see the bubbles and stuff that would come out so that you get, get the, the poison out. And so I was like, I was I was like meditating in my mind, and um, and I learned about, about the power of the mind, and and I and I just remember that coming into effect at that time, and I think that that was through an external help because it was really different from being like I'm so determined to see this through, I'm going to die, I'm going to make this happen, to I've got to live, I've got to live, I've got to I've got to get healthy, I've got to get better. It was just this change. So I realized, you know, it, it had to be something external came and helped me. And and I guess as I willed myself to live, and I, in my mind, I was going to imagine the poison leaving my body. And and then when I started noticing, oh, look, in the bag. <laughs> and, I was, and I think they thought it was a bit strange because I knew I wasn't, you know, uh, like, I'm going to see this through, I'm not going to live. To suddenly, oh, look, 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 it's coming out, it's coming out. <laughs> so I like being excited. That when I'd see little lumps coming out into the urine bag. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, you know, so it was a month of recovery from that. Um, they, they moved me to the Henry Bennett Ward, and that was actually my last admitted, my last time admitted into mental hospital, um, 2011. Um, and, yeah, that's five years later now, and 
my life is a lot different in and uh I know going through through that it was not the most pleasant experience not just for, for me but for my family and for, for the ones that love me I don't realize you know the pain that I could be causing them you, you just not in that state of mind to actually understand you're actually in a state of mind where you think and you believe that they're better off without you well it's actually not true you you are loved you are valued but um but it does help to be around people that care and understand but it's hard for them as well and they they want to help but sometimes they don't know what to do so i guess it was a situation like that like what do we do for jewelry <laughs> so i you know i went through that and i guess it's taught me you know um being up here on the hibiscus coast I've met some wonderful, amazing friends that have been through very similar stories, and and just the goosebumps and the the um, inspiration that we are to each other, the healing that comes when we share our stories, and the release of it when we get to talk about it is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So I know this taught me that you know we attempt to suicide, but if it's not our time to go, you're not going to be taken. And you, so it's, I mean, it's, I've had friends, I've lost my, I've lost friends to suicide. Um, and, you know, I, I realize now how important it was that I was to heal because I look at my life now and the work that I'm doing now, I see it as, well, it's a God-led work. Um, and I'm, I see myself as a tool and I see this work as my medicine. So, um. Um, finding my mission in life is what's helped me to get where I am today. But it also reminds me that what that what we go through, the, the trials that we go through, and the and the desperate situations when we really want to die, they're so real and how frightening it can be when you're that person because it takes a lot of courage to go and do something like that. But I won't do it again because <laughs> you know. I, the pain it's just not worth it so um yeah well that was my my experience of my greatest suicide attempt the others were just um taking a lot of overdose overdosing on medication and i just remember it was always a really bad experience every time it's just not worth it and if you're feeling suicidal please talk to someone that you can trust please reach out to someone it's not it's not always the easiest thing to do because in my mind the way I did it I kept it to myself and I planned it quietly and privately so um, we also need to be very aware and look out for our, our friends and our loved ones because they could be going through it they could be planning it themselves so just if, if you're not going through suicide but you you are concerned about someone that is going through suicide there are plenty of helplines help out there, just um, it's something that you need to do because you can save a life.